Hello, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's presentation of Language and Birds. I'm Rebecca Roberts. I'm the Curator of Programming at Planet Word, a Museum of Words and Language here in Washington, DC. That's it in my Zoom background if you haven't had a chance to visit yet. Uh, if you're already a member of Planet Word and following us on social media, getting our newsletter, all those wonderful things, thank you for that support. Uh, it's the way we're able to keep admission to the museum free and bring you programs like this one. Uh, this program series in particular, Language And, is also made possible with support from the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Foundation. So thanks very much to them for their support. I am delighted to welcome Stephen Moss to the program. He's a naturalist and a writer and living at the intersection of language and birds. Uh, his book, he has written a lot of books about birds, but Mrs. Morrow's Warbler is the one that really caught my attention in terms of the intersection of language and birds. Stephen Moss, welcome to Planet Word. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Rebecca. It's an absolute pleasure. How long have you been a birder? Uh, since before I can remember, which is, I'm afraid, nearly 60 years. Uh, I was a child. My mother took me out to feed the ducks down on the River Thames near London. And I saw some funny black ducks. I didn't know what they were. She said, we've got a bird book. They were coots. That was it. So coot is my first bird. <laughs> uh, I imagine you have a list. Don't all I have lots lists. of lists. My <laughs> friend Graham says I have lists of lists. Right. I have a world list. I have I have garden lists. I have patch lists. I'm big on patch lists. So yeah, I've got a lot of lists. And I imagine there are a lot of birders in our audience today. But what to you is the appeal? Gosh, well, Roger Tory Peterson famously said, "I think it was birds have wings, they fly," and it's to do with I think that idea that these creatures can escape the bounds of Earth, the surly bonds of Earth, and go up in the air. And of course, they're with us everywhere. I mean, my, my dear friend Sean Dooley in Australia, who I'm sure some of the audience know or know of used to say people ask me where I go birding as if I have to make a special arrangement to go out and do it as he said you know even when we're asleep we dream about birds <laughs> so uh you're in the UK uh in Somerset we, there's the disputed but famous line that we are divided by a common language um and yet I find it sort of fascinating that not only are we you know, speaking different dialects of the same language, but English, you know, is famously changeable. Um, it is a constantly evolving, uh, no holds barred kind of a language. And uh, as you say in linguist David Crystal's phrase, English is a vacuum cleaner of a language sucking up words from any other language that its speakers come in contact with. Um, I, I heard someone say that English, you know, tackles other languages and back alleys for their syntax and random vocabulary. <laughs> um, That's lovely. Yeah. And, and yet really nice thing. the names of birds are sort of surprisingly constant, like thousands of years constant. Yeah. I mean, there are some, you know, if you, I've got a lot of old bird books up on the shelves behind me and they include, you know, Victorian bird books or ones earlier than that, where names like golden crested wren for the gold crest or, you know, similar to your kinglet. So some names have changed, of course, and I'm sure we'll come on later to the fact that a lot of American bird names are changing for more interesting political and social reasons now. But you're right. I mean, the point about names of anything is that they last longer than languages. So I'll give you an example. Three birds in Britain, the well, they're also <laughs> birds that um, two of them, are similar ones occur in, in the States. Wheat ear, red start, yellow hammer. These are all Anglo-Saxon words that when the Norman conquest happened and English changed completely over about a hundred years, those names, which were Saxon names, and it was wheat eos, which means white ass, white bottom, basically because of the, the white rum, didn't make any sense anymore. Wheat eos, what's that mean? So it became wheat ear. And there are so many examples of this in language but names are particularly prone to this. So they last, but they sort of shift into something people can understand. I, yes, I actually I want to not leave the Norman conquest for a second, because one of the things you can learn at Planet Word uh, is that after the Norman conquest, these sort of um, paired Germanic and Frenchish names, especially for animals and the meat product of those animals. Um, so, you know, pig versus pork or 
cattle versus beef, um, they, they sustain together rather than one word replacing the other. And there are class reasons for that. You know, maybe it was the Saxons who were tending the cattle and the French who were eating the fancy protein. But um, instead of one word taking over another, they stayed on parallel tracks. Absolutely. Yeah, we um, have that with bird names. We have three sets of bird names in English that are old French, and they are ducks, mallard, widgeon, shoveler, gadwall, gargany, birds of prey, buzzard, kestrel. These, these, are, these are French names, old French from Latin, and game birds like pheasant and partridge. And it's exactly the same reason. Those three groups of birds were either eaten by the French nobility or used to kill the birds that they ate. And so they have French names, like um, as beef does, but and almost all other birds in, in English, mostly the older names, the common birds have Anglo-Saxon names, Germanic names. See, this is why etymology is so interesting because it's a history lesson built into the linguistics. Exactly. Yeah, and we go back further than that. Of course, I start with the sound of birds. Most of the oldest bird names are onomatopoeic, and some of them are obviously onomatopoeic. Cuckoo, chiff chaff, which is a small warbler that literally says chiff chiff chaff chiff chaff. Others we don't realize are onomatopoeic. Raven, crow. How is raven onomatopoeic? Raven. Oh. You heard a raven? Ra. They go like that, don't they? And so, and what's fascinating is that. The name for raven is the same or similar in all the Germanic languages, German, Dutch, English, but also all the Scandinavian languages, Norwegian, Swedish, huh. Icelandic. And hraven is probably, in Icelandic, is probably the same, or hraven is probably the original, or one of, you know, almost the original name. We don't know the original name, of course. And those names must be well over 5,000 years old because those two languages split a couple of thousand years before the birth of Christ. So, you know, more modern bird names may be the same in German and Dutch and English, but different in Scandinavian. So, you know, this, and it becomes, it becomes a sort of linguistic detective act. And I had a lot of help in this book from David Crystal, Simon Horobin, who are, are you know, professional academic linguists, um, you know, to try to sort of root into these things. But yeah, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. It's especially interesting to me that an onomatopoeia would cross languages because not only do different individuals hear things differently, but birds actually don't necessarily have a consistent song in every region they're in. That's right. Well, the chiff chaff's a good example. In the, if you look in the Peterson guide, you know, he came over to Europe and did a wonderful guide that I grew up with here as well. Um, and it used to give, the original Peterson European, British and European guide, used to give the names in, I think it was, French, German, Swedish, and Dutch. And for the chiff chaff, they are chiff chaff, zif zaf, zilp zalp. You know, so they're, they're clearly the same name, but people hear them differently. You know, it's like cockerel, is cockerico, isn't it, in Spanish? So, you know, it's the same principle that we hear a sound and we, re we replicate it differently. Um, except in Spanish, uh, it's mosquitero común for chiff chaff, and in French, it's something else, you know, Puile Veloz or something, Speedy Warbler. So, you know, there's no logic to bird names. That's the first thing you need to know about bird names. You know, they're, if they're not consistent. Well, also, what difference do you think it makes that a lot of, especially those earlier names, are part of a spoken language, not necessarily a written one? I think what's interesting is people say nowadays, and when I was writing the book, I came across a great line that said a language is a dialect. I think it's something like a dialect that's 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 with an army. Yeah, a dialect with an army, exactly. Yeah. Now, a lot of modern bird names in English are, and including American bird names, of course, are folk names that became the official name. So for the warblers, chiff chaff, black cap, red, um, and white throat are clearly folk names, whereas willow warbler, sage warbler, reed warbler were written by scientists. And the same is true in America, a name like bobolink, whippoorwill, um, you know, a, a lot of names for relatively common birds usually, or birds that used to be common, are 
are clearly folk names that someone has, yeah, that's why when you look at a list of names, whether it's American or, or British um, birds, you go through a list and it all says something red, you know, something warbler, something, and then of course you have American red star. You've got all your warblers and you've got American red star. Why? Because it's got a red tail, red stayort, Anglo-Saxon for tail. But it's because, of course, like with the American robin, sorry, the British came over and were homesick and went, oh, that looks like a robin. I mean, it doesn't look everything like a robin, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so when you explain to someone that the American robin is a thrush, and you say, what, uh, in Britain, they say, what do you mean it's a thrush? You say, well, like a blackbird. And they go, well, a blackbird isn't a thrush, it's a blackbird. And then you're like, oh my God. And then your blackbirds are grackles, which are orioles, aren't they? So they're not, you know, <laughs> forgive me if I've got any of that wrong, but you know what I mean? It's, it's like, you know, you have sparrows, but they're not out, they're not the same family as our sparrows. You have warblers that are not our warblers. And then, and then you take our names, perfectly good names like diver and you turn it into loon but loon is such a great name it's a wonderful name yeah i was watching on golden pond the other day and i, I you know wonderful yes the loon and of course jaeger we have skewer you have jaeger but you know so but it's great isn't it so you know we we share these names and then we occasionally divert but that's what we should do well i also enjoyed your exploration of uh false explanations for words that names that have had sort of lost their connection to the original translation you mentioned wheat ear yeah. um which didn't have anything to do with wheat originally that's right yeah yeah it means white but the white became wheat yellow hammer is a good one all the other buntings in britain and then we don't have as many as as well your your buntings are called sparrows of course or long spurs but we have a few species of bunting and they're all called you know, corn bunting, reed bunting, snow bunting, yellow hammer. Why is it a yellow hammer? Does it, does it sound very loud? Does it have a banging song? No, it's German. Yellow hammer. Hammer is still, I think in Germany, it's gold hammer. Um, so it's a yellow bird that is a bunting, but it was called hammer because that was the German name. And that's stuck. So that's a folk name. Again, you know, these are folk names that lasted. And when you get a name like um, Lapland Longspur or uh, Red-Throated Loon or any of those names, they were created by scientists. No, no normal person, no folk said, oh, we'll call that a, a Lapland Longspur or a, you know, I mean, if you go to South America, an oscillated hemispingus or, a, you know, all those things. All the complicated names were created by scientists, mostly from the 18th century onwards. Whereas uh, anything that used to be common usually has a name that's lasted all that time, which I think is lovely. You know, the fact that we're saying names that, that people spoke thousands of years ago. And, you know, it's it's especially interesting to me, we should clarify, we're talking about common names, largely. We did do a program about binomial nomenclature and Linnaeus and scientific names um, across species. And, you know, I, I think the original intention of, of that movement was to simplify, um, but it seems in birds, the scientific nomenclature has not necessarily caught on quite as well. Well, it did, because I, when I was reading about this, I discovered that, for example, I think it was the shoveler, what we call the northern shoveler, um, had, you know, the names before Linnaeus were things like, they were, you know, seven or eight Latin words strung together, Ooh. basically meant, you know, weird big bird, bird duck-like creature that floats <laughs> in the water or something, you know, and Linnaeus, of course, changed that and that was brilliant and it meant that I could go to Spain many years ago with a wonderful bird called Tono Valverde and we didn't really we didn't know the Spanish or English names for the birds but I could say ah that's a uh, so-and-so in with using the scientific name and he knew what I meant and vice versa then about um five years ago they decided to change all the scientific names so all the tits in Britain the equivalent to your chickadees um, they've they've given all the genera a different name, so now it's really confusing. Hmm. Why? Uh, because at least the scientific names were consistent. Because they've realised, of course, they they're not related to each other, or not as closely related yeah. as they thought. Don't get me started on warblers. There are. <laughs> all, all I might things, want to get you started on warblers. All the things we thought were 
European, Eurasian warblers, old world warblers, turn out not to be in the same family at all. There's various genera that actually come from completely different families. We just saw a small insect eating bird that turned up in spring and left in autumn and said, well, that's a warbler. Oh, so is that one. And of course, culturally, we think of them as warblers and we'll still use that forever. It's no use saying to bird watchers, oh, you know, oh, sorry, they're not in, that, that group of warblers are, are, are actually babblers because they don't care. <laughs> which is probably right. a good thing. <laughs> but well, this is I, the whole genetic thing, which of course started in the U USA, you know, the Sibley and Monroe and all these amazing scientists basically suddenly realizing that the most bizarre relationships between birds that we would never have thought of turn out to be true. Well, I find that fascinating because if, if advances in genetic research allow a more specific scientific pinpointing of relationships among species, um, and yet birding in particular um, has been traditionally, uh, historically, you know, um, cataloged by non-scientists, right? It's a it's a layperson's game. Um, then you've got to sort of not necessarily warring, but maybe counterproductive imperatives there, um, both of whom are interested in preserving and, and uh, expanding the knowledge of ornithology, but from different purposes. Yeah, and you get, I mean, for example, I said earlier that bird names are not logical because within a family, they'll all be called something. And then there's the exception, like the American Robin or the, the American Red Star. There was a bird, uh, an ornithologist back in the mid 19th century called William McGillivray, who was a very um, cantankerous Scot. Um, and he decided to produce this amazing five volume um, British birds book, which was extraordinary, but he changed every single name because he said, you know, you can't have a family of warblers and call that one a black cap and that one a chiffchaff. You have to call it black capped warbler because otherwise people won't know. And of course it never caught on because people don't want to be told what to do. <laughs> um, likewise though, the big problem now is you pick up a field guide, and particularly if you pick up a field guide, say for Costa Rica or somewhere in South America or Africa, and the families are all in the wrong order. And you look at the new bird list that someone's put swifts and night jars sort of near the top of the list. Well, they've never been up there. You know, they've moved falcons next to parrots because they're actually much more closely related than falcons are to other hawks and, 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 and raptors. And my friend uh, Richard Crossley, who many of your audience will know, who did the wonderful Crossley Guides, extraordinary guy, a, a Brit who lives in um, Cape May in New Jersey. I think he's now moved to California. Um, and Richard and a number of British and American birders were saying, look, why don't we make field guides logical i don't make them follow all these changes because it will mean you're reprinting every year or two because a scientist has suddenly decided that that group don't belong here they belong there and so they said why don't we go back to actually it was a field guide from the 1940s which had seabirds and then water birds i was in fresh water so you know ducks geese etc but also gulls and terns together perhaps or see they might be under seabirds and then land birds and basically then you know that all field guides have the same order. So when you're standing in the Costa Rican rainforest trying to find a family in your guide, you're not having to go through beginning to end because you know that whatever it is, is, is up the top or up the end. You know, instead of thinking, where's it gone? Which is the problem right. at the moment. Right, where is it filed? Yeah, exactly. So it's about filing. But yeah, I think you're right. I think that, you know, the science, I mean, many ornithologists, professional ornithologists are also very keen birders. I mean, many of the best ornithologists are very good and very keen birders, but, you know, I think they feel that tension as well. As someone who has, you know, delved into a lot of the kind of hidden history of these names, are you helped or hurt by the fact that people write about birds? They're poetic. Uh, people put them in descriptions. They, you know, it's not like trying to track all the different species of worms that might not make it into some epic poem. No, um, I'm not hurt at all. No, I, I'm not a scientist. I, I did an English degree at Cambridge. I love language. I love, I, I write books about, I actually write biographies of birds. I've written one on the European robin, the wren, our wren. Yeah, we always call, this is a very English thing. We call all our birds by one word. Robin, wren, swan, swallow. 
<laughs> by which I mean European robin, Eurasian wren, mute swan, barn swallow. And I've written those four books, and I'm doing owls now. <laughs> um, and these, these books combine the behavior of the science of what I call the real bird, what a bird is doing when it doesn't care what you're thinking, which is most of the time, with the whole cultural side of a bird like the robin or the wren, which has folk tales and poetry and observations and beliefs. And I find that fascinating. I love the fact that there's like two of every bird. There's a, there's a, the real one and there's the cultural one. Hmm. If you bring those together, the really weird thing, so we're going slightly off bird names, but the really weird thing is that the things that are in the culture of a bird are always based on its behavior. So I'll give you an example. The barn swallow, um, sailors around the world get tattoos of swallows. Why do they get a tattoo of a swallow? People used to think it was because swallows travel the world like sailors. It's not. It's because swallows, barn swallows, come back to where they're born. So it's about home. And I love that notion. I love the fact that the, the robin is seen as a very cute bird in England, the, the European robin, even though it's incredibly violent and, and you know, has, it, it's a very territorial bird. But it's seen as very cute because when we used to get cold, hard winters with snow, they would come to the back door of people's cottages or farms and cock their head on one side and look cute because they were hungry and they'd fluff their feathers out because they were cold. So we love robins. They're Britain's favourite bird. But behaviourally, you know, and we, we shouldn't make these judgments on birds, but they're really not very nice at all. <laughs> um, I want to get into some of the stories because I really enjoyed that part of Mrs. Morris Warbler. Um, tell me about the description Isabelline. <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. There are, there are several birds in the old world with the name Isabelline or Isabelline. Um, one is a wheat ear and one is a shrike. And there's a few others, I think. And they're very pale. They're a sort of pale, almost dirty yellowish grey. And the, the legend has it that Queen... Um, that a, I can't even remember which queen, I think it was a Portuguese queen, Isabella. Her husband was, in the 16th century, he was off on um, trying to break a siege, I think in the Netherlands. Sorry, I wrote this book a few years ago and I haven't reread it for a while. Um, he was trying to break a siege and she said, I will not change my underwear until my husband comes home safely. And her underwear went a sort of yellowy grey colour. And that's where Isabelline comes from. It's a lovely story. I'm afraid it's probably complete nonsense. And we think that possibly it comes, there's, a, there's an Italian word, zibellino, which means lion coloured. And lions have that slightly greyish yellow look, don't they, on their body. So it's probably from that, because the, the word Isabelline has been found before that Isabella even lived. Then, of course, someone said, oh, no, it's not that Isabella, it's Ferdinand and Isabella, the famous Catholic kings of, of Spain and Portugal. But he didn't go on a siege, so, you know, it doesn't work. So but I love your this. underwear clean. I mean, yeah. yeah, as someone once said, does it matter if it's true or not? It's a very good story. It is a very good story. A little gross. <laughs> yeah, a little gross, exactly. And, and um, the title of the book, of course, Mrs. Morris Warbler, yes. talk about... I have a copy. Oh, good. Excellent. Because I have a Kindle. Otherwise, I'd hold it up. Um, we talk about naming um, birds after real live humans. And this actually came up in our taxonomy program that it's considered not done to name things after yourself. Yes. Um, yes. But you you could name something after someone you admire. But also, apparently, there's um, revenge naming where people name particularly ugly or disgusting species after people they hate. <laughs> That's lovely. I hadn't heard that. I mean, obviously, Reg Moreau named the bird after his wife, Winifred, and it is sometimes called Winifred's Warbler. But yes, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very rare gull, in, but it's getting less rare, which is good, in the Mediterranean called Odoan's gull, uh, named after a famous French um, scientist, I think 18th century, early 19th century, called Odoan. And it was named by his friend and colleague at the museum in Paris, 
uh, Monsieur Charles Perredo. And you can imagine him saying, oh, Monsieur Perredo, thank you so much for naming this very special bird after me. One day I will name a gull after you. Only he didn't. So no one's ever heard of Perredo, but birders all over Europe know about Odoan. They don't know anything about it, but they know, you know, just as birders in the States, you know, know about Wilson or Audubon. Now, of course, Audubon is very famous anyway, but many of the people who birds are named after in both Europe and the United States and elsewhere in the world, some of them, we don't even know who they were. Hmm. Um, we just know there's a name. Uh, others, we know who they were and we wish we didn't. So but I don't know if we want to get into that. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, now you've piqued my curiosity. Well, you, I don't know if you know, but in the States at the moment, there is a very strong movement to change the names of birds with um, which are named after people. In Britain, almost all the birds named after people they, in Europe, they run from the sort of 16th century, sometimes even earlier, right up to the 19th, even vaguely into the 20th. In North America, it tends to be more focused. It's mostly, I think, late 18th and 19th centuries for obvious reasons, because that's when the continent was being explored. So you have, you know, Lewis's, um, you have Clark's Nutcracker, don't you? And Lewis's Woodpecker, obviously named after Lewis and Clark. You have a number of order books. Names. You have Wilson's Warby, you have Wilson's Petrel. Um, you have Bonaparte's Gull, which isn't named after that Bonaparte, it's his nephew. But you also have birds named after people who were slave owners or who were um, Confederate uh, military people. And the recent one is McCown's Longspur, which has had its name changed. I can't remember what to. Um, but, you know, this is part of the, the, the trying to recapture and remake our history. And of course, in parts of the world, including Britain, this is very controversial. People get very upset when we criticize people from the past and say things like, well, it was different then. And that's one viewpoint. And the other viewpoint is, no, this man was a slave trader. We don't want him uh, commemorated in the name in Bristol of our theater, as they were, uh, or in, case of the United States in the names of our birds. So names are being changed. I personally think we need to be careful that we don't change all the um, acronyms, no, not acronyms, are they? What's the name of birds named after people? Uh, I should know that. Um, because they, that is part of their history. But it's also true to say an awful lot of birds named to people. White thrush is named after the very famous British naturalist Gilbert White. He would never have seen one. He would never even have heard of it. Buick Swan wasn't discovered until after Thomas Buick, another very famous British naturalist, died. Hmm. Well, same with Montague's Harrier. You know, so we have birds named after people. Sometimes it's appropriate. Sometimes it's not. And is there some central body that is the arbiter in these things? How do things get renamed? Question. No, <laughs> <It's the answer. laughs> uh, uh, and that's why you have different names in. North America and Europe, for example, and quite rightly. So the AOU, I think, is the American Ornithologist Union. I think in the States would do it. In Britain, it's the British Ornithologist Union. So names are changed occasionally. Robin in Britain wasn't called Robin. Robin is, of course, a nickname. It was Ruddock, and then it was Redbreast, and then it became Robin Redbreast, which is a little affectionate name, like Robin Hood. And and then it became Robin. That wasn't changed officially till the 20th century. So that's a, you know, but everyone always calls them Robins and always have. Our Robin is not your Robin? No, your Robin's a, a large, bulky, rather attractive, red-breasted, um, large thrush, basically. Larger than most of your thrushes. Most of your thrushes are quite cute and small, like wood thrush and Grey cheek thrush and things like that. So no, it's a, it's a big beefy thrush, and there are robins all over the world. None of them, virtually none of them, are robins. Huh. There's a couple in the, there's a couple in America in the Japan. Sorry, that are related to our robin. There's robins in Australia. I mean, Australia. There's wrens. There's fairy wrens. There's magpies. There's um, magpie larks. There's um, robins. None of them are remotely related to the European or even American birds. They're, they're all their own Australian birds, but explorers saw them and thought oh that's got a red breast or pinkish breast we'll call it a robin um i wanted to ask you about um 
names of birds that also are words for other things. Uh, kite, for instance, and crane. Yes. Um, which came first? Well, generally, the bird name comes first. So the children's, sometimes adult toy, the kite that we fly, is so called cool because it looks a little bit like a kite. And cranes, you know, cranes, the bird, are tall and stately, and so are cranes. Sometimes there's no relation to the word. So, for example, the word sniper, meaning someone who can shoot very well, um, does come from someone who could shoot snipe the way they because snipe fly away very quickly and they zigzag. But other words that are used um, that sound like they might come from a bird, so grouse, to say, you know, oh, someone's grousing, they're, they're complaining about things, almost certainly doesn't relate to grouse. Um, I was trying to test some people I take some bird tours out and I have clients who are always quite keen on this sort of thing. So I, I asked them the other day, because I've written a new book and it includes a bird which is named very specifically after a product it makes and it's called the guane cormorant. And guane, guano, is of course, how can I put this tactfully, bird poo, bird droppings. And it was harvested in Peru and brought to Europe and North America and changed the world. Uh, which is why I've written about it. And I asked, are there any other birds named after a product? And then you get, you get clever people who say, yes, turkey, because we eat turkey. But of course, <laughs> we eat turkey because it comes from turkeys. It's not, the bird isn't named after the meat <laughs> or chicken, indeed. Um, and we can only think of two, but I'd be fascinating if any of your audience can think of any more, because I'm sure there are. Of the two, the one, the only is oil bird, which is a relative of the night jars that is found in South America and Central America and, and, and was harvested, the chicks were harvested for their oil before petroleum-based oils. And the other is edible nest swiftlet from Asia, which ne the nests, which are made with saliva, are used to make Chinese bird's nest soup. Oh. The other one they might come up with is mutton bird, which is a name of a shearwater that was you harvested a lot by sailors in the in the southern hemisphere, and it tastes apparently tastes like mutton. But mutton bird is a is a folk name. It's not the official name. I think it's short-tailed shearwater. But you know, so that's another one. But there are very few of them of the world's world sort of eleven thousand species of bird. They're the only ones I could think of. Well, there you go. Challenge audience: birds are named after products. Um, the there are also birds, of course, named after places, um, which isn't always a particularly useful indication of where you can find that bird, as I understand it. Oh, it's utterly hopeless, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's partly because birds were often named where they were first shot. So a bird in Britain called the Dartford Warbler is named after a very unexciting <laughs> town on the edge of London in North Kent called Dartford, but it's not found there, and it probably was found there 250 years ago when it was shot but you know um so that's a fairly hopeless name for that um and even names like mediterranean gull you know or iceland gull iceland gulls don't breed in iceland they breed i think in canada and you know further west so there's quite a lot of names that are place-based but inappropriate or they're a bit unhelpful like arctic tern or northern wheat ear which clearly you know, northern is everywhere. <laughs> so, right. So, uh, or, yeah, or quite a lot Canada of geese, which seem to be everywhere. Canada geese, which were introduced into Britain, yeah. Um, and we also have, of course, a lot of birds named after habitat. So in Britain, a lot of the warblers are uh, willow warbler, sedge warbler, reed warbler, aquatic warbler, which sounds like it should be wearing a little snorkel. I don't know if, I'm trying to think of American birds named after habitat. I'm sure there are lots. Um, sage grouse i suppose unless it eats sage uh, you know so that habitat is quite a common thing for birds to be named after but again pretty much exclusively by scientists so 17th 18th 19th centuries when these these last scarcer birds or, or less obvious birds were being discovered well also i imagine in addition to language being changeable habitat is changeable right yeah, absolutely. And habitat doesn't work because 
um, we have two birds in Britain called the marsh tit and willow tit. Marsh tits live in woods and should be called a woodland tit or an oak tit. And willow tits nest on, live on marshes, but the two look very similar and we think they were mixed up. That's another story in the book. Oh, mixed up. Well, basically the willow tit wasn't discovered in Britain until 1900. And it was discovered by two German ornithologists when they found, a, um, they were looking through a collection of stuffed dead birds and, and found them and said, but these are willow tits because they're very common in Europe. And the British scientists said, we haven't got any willow tits in Britain. And they said, well, you must have because this was shot here. And then they found they were. And these are two birds that are very hard to tell apart. Or you have alder and willow flycatcher. That's a good example. Alder and willow flycatcher are incredibly similar. I have no idea if they live in alders and willows, but I very much doubt that they're exclusively <laughs> confined to those places. So when you're a beginner bird, you think, oh, willow flycatcher, I must go and look for it in willows, but it's probably found in all sorts of trees. Um, which leads me to ask, if, if people are interested in birding and bird names, what recommendations do you have for people getting started? Oh gosh, um, the lovely thing about birding is that it's a very cheap and very accessible hobby in that you need a pair of binoculars and you really do, and you should spend as much money as you can on a pair of binoculars, but a couple of hundred dollars will get you a pretty reasonable pair. You think about photography, you know, you're probably spending several thousand dollars on a really decent camera. And you need, you know, warm clothes or clothes for hot weather, and then you just need to go out. And in any, you know, location in the States, any backyard, in cities, in suburbs, out in the, the, the wider um, states, you know, you will find birds and you will find different birds in different seasons. And what I always say to people is get yourself a local patch, get yourself a place that you watch, ideally a place with a bit of water. That could be a park. I mean, Central Park, of course, very famous. For, and I'm sure there's parks in Washington that are just as good, but very famous for migratory birds in spring and, and fall. So, you know, find yourself a place that's that's local to you that you can visit perhaps every couple of days maybe as you walk to college or school or, or, or uh, work or you know take the dog out or whatever you know or just go and do a jog you know find somewhere jogging doesn't work with birding because you keep stopping I go cycling most mornings and I take my binoculars sometimes and it's hopeless because I see something and of course <laughs> Um, but yeah, so, you know, that's the great thing about birding. And there's lots of good books about this. I mean, David Sibley's books are, are wonderful guides. And, um, but also he's written a, you know, guides about how to bird watch. Um, I can't remember its title, but it's very good. And are you going more by sight or by sound? When you oh, like? that's a very good question. Until I was in my mid thirties, it was entirely sight and I missed everything. Well, I missed every small bird. And I worked with a very famous comedian and, and birder here called Bill Oddy, who used to work with the Monty Python team. And he's an amazing guy. And Bill is a musician and he was incredibly good on bird sound. So we'd go out filming and he'd be going, oh, there's a white throat, there's a lesser white throat. And I'm like, is there? I don't know. You know, I know, I know the really common birds. And so I, I learned them. I made myself learn. And I can go out now on a spring day around a little, um, nature reserve near my home in Somerset and I can hear on a really good day 10 different species of warbler and if I don't bother to track them down I won't see a single one because British warblers hide away you know and sing in the reed bed or in the trees and so unless I make a special effort I'm not going to see them so if I didn't know the sound I'd see no species of warbler hmm. and that's very true in the states as well a lot of the birds have very beautiful and very distinctive songs. Um, we have a question, uh, someone says, can you talk about this story from my friend, Nancy Scherer, who told me that Italian paintings sometimes include a mistaken bird name, e.g. calling a goldfinch a cardinal, maybe because in Italy, the goldfinch is called Cardellino and its Latin name is Cardulus Cardulus. Um, the bird's similar sounding Italian name becomes cardinal, for instance, in the Madonna and Child with St. John the Baptist in the 1480s. Wow. I didn't know that, and that's fascinating. I know that goldfinches, which are a very distinctive European finch, different from yours, not the American goldfinch again, same family, different bird, both very beautiful. Um, our goldfinches are very strong 
um, symbol in medieval iconography and art. I can't for the life of me remember what it means, but Donna Tartt wrote that. Um, oh, book. that amazing book. Yeah, and that it that uses that as a symbol, you know. So, um, I, but I didn't know they used a different name. That's very interesting. I mean, Cardinal's a great name, of course, because it's a bird named after a human um, person that it resembles, i.e. it's bright red and cardinals wear red uniform. The other one of those, and I never quite know how to pronounce this, but I'm gonna have a go. I think when I've heard it in the States, it's prothonotary warbler, or I'd say prothonotary warbler, because I'm English, but I think it's prothonotary warbler. And apparently a prothonotary was a Vatican official who wore a yellow uniform and a prothonotary warbler is the most extraordinary bright yellow bird and huh. one of the beautiful birds i've ever seen so you know and there's a few birds like that named after you know something from our world and again you know the cardinal I and mean, there's card different cardinals but the famous cardinal of course is your own um, someone writes, you mentioned your lists. I have a long list of bird names used to name animals and plants, oh, uh, such as a duckbill platypus or an ostrich fern. Do you also amuse yourself in this way? They ask. I, I do. And at the end of this book, let me just have a look. I did a whole list of things like that. So I did, here's one. I don't think I did birds named after animals. Oh, I might have done. I've got birds named after man-made objects. Barn swallow, boat-billed heron, booted racket tail. Banana quit. That's not quite, is it? But um, Gould's jewel front. That's a hummingbird. Saddlebacks. You know, rifle birds. There's a whole load of those. Birds named after elements. Birds named after gems and special precious stones. Uh, Wait, birds named after elements? Elements. Oh, yes. We have, uh, hang on, where is it? Elements, compounds and minerals. I'm going to have to turn my little light on here because I can't read this properly. Sorry, it's that shining into you. Um, bronze mannequin, uh, cobalt winged parakeet, copper sunbird, copper rumped hummingbird, goldfinch, golden eye. Uh, golden eye, of course, is named after a James Bond film. But it's Wait, not really. It's the the other bird way came first, it. right? <laughs> well, the bird came first, and Ian Fleming named his house in Jamaica golden eye after the bird, and then the film was then named after Ian Fleming's house. Silverbills, lots of birds, you know, Stevie Vented Hummingbird, um, and then gems, Amethyst Sunbird, Emerald Wool Spotted Woodpecker. So I've got quite a lot of these. Oh yeah, no, I've got other animals names. Yeah, bat hawk, beater, buffalo weaver, bullfinch, catbird, cattle egret, cicada birds, fox sparrow, that's one of yours, oxpecker, rhinoceros auklet. I was on a pelagic trip, a seabird trip, Rip off California with the wonderful Debbie Shearwater, and someone shouted, Oh my God, we've got the rhino! And it was the rhinoceros auklet, known by American birds apparently as a rhino, a very rare wow. small bird. Um, birds named after royalty Emperor Penguin, Imperial Eagle, uh, Prince Raspodis Chirico, I've seen that in Ethiopia, um, Duchess Lorikeet, Lady Amherst's pheasant. Um, yeah, I'll save the amazing names for the last bit if you want. I've got 33 amazing <laughs> names. Yeah. That was already fairly amazing. I, you, you say in the book, bird names are far more than just words. Every single one of them tells a story, a story that runs parallel with our own human narrative expressed through our history, language and culture. And I, I'm not a birder. It had never occurred to me to sort of use that lens to yeah. uncover some of these, these stories. But it really is a kind of lovely way to see the world. Um, it is. It's a way of seeing history. You know, you see the, the, the fact that the English, the British, of course, English language conquered the world and the British conquered the world. So you go to somewhere um, like East Africa and a lot of the birds have very British names and you go to South Africa and a lot of them have Afrikaans names, but they're the same species. So Turaco and lorry and things so there's history in this and there's also the fact that I mean well, I teach nature writing uh, I teach an MA in it and when I'm teaching it we always talk about a book and a friend of mine said this and it's a quote from Henry James you've told me what the story of the book is what's the story of the story so this book is ostensibly about 
how birds got their names. And it is about how birds got their names. But I think it's far more than that. I think any book is far more than that, because as you're writing it, you start discovering things. And the thing I discovered in this book is when I started birding as a child 50 years ago, there were roughly 8,600 species of bird in the world. Because of the way the DNA, the science has gone, there are now, they've split lots of species that they thought were the same ones. And there are now, like Baltimore and Bullock's Aurea, for example, and there are now around 11,000 species. But the paradox is more species have gone extinct or are going extinct in that time than have been created. Yeah. So it looks good, it doesn't. It looks like we've got lots more birds than we used to because we've decided that those two birds that look similar are actually two different species, but we're still losing them. And I think that's, that's the message of the book, really, the, the fact that bird names have this wonderful quality. And once a bird has gone extinct, like the dodo, its name doesn't disappear, but it means something else. And I think that's, you know, that's the tragedy we all face at the moment, really. That's the fact that the environment, biodiversity loss, climate crisis is, is declining. And people on both sides of the Atlantic are denying this, um, particularly in Washington and London. Uh, so, uh, um, you know, that's something that we need to deal with. But birds are this wonderful message for us, wonderful celebration, but they're also, you know, it's a terrible cliche that they are the canary in the coal mine, as they used to say, you know, the miners would take a canary down to the coal mine. And if the canary passed out, they knew there was a leak of gas and they, they got out as quick as they, they could. If they waited, they didn't take the canary, they would have died before they realised. Well, we're facing the canary in the coal mine now, aren't we? And the birds are there. So I think that that's the sort of main message, apart from the fact birds are wonderful. Um, somebody asks, can you speak about the language of birds, by which I assume she means how birds communicate with each other? That's a very good question. Yeah, I mean, bird song is fascinating, partly because it's made, birds have a different vocal setup from us. We have vocal cords, so we can make a certain kind of sound. And birds have a syrinx, which has two different chambers, so they can mingle sounds and make sounds that we would find it very difficult to make. So when we name a bird after its sound, like cuckoo or chiff chaff or raven, we're not very good at it. You know, they should be called, you know, jiv jaff and cuckoo. But we can't, we can't, we can imitate cuckoo, but we can't, we can't, if you like, fix it as a name. So we come up with the best we can. Um, but in the end, bird songs are fascinating because they're almost all done by the male. They're all, they're, they are basically territorial. They are saying to all the other males, get out of my territory, and to all the females, come into my territory. And just as you have um, birds like the peacock, which do that by displaying, by a visual display, and they're doing exactly the same thing. They're saying to male peacocks, get out and females come in. It's fascinating that birds are almost divided down the middle into look, little drab things that sing beautifully, like the nightingale, and beautiful plumaged things like birds of paradise, where it's all about the look and the display. And there's a few somewhere in between, you know. Um, the other bird sounds, of course, are bird calls, which are there for all sorts of other reasons, communication, um, if you listen to a flock of warblers in, in fall, they'll be communicating with each other to stay together to, to find food, or an alarm call. Of course, lots of birds give an alarm call, which is saying there's an owl nearby or there's something you know, uh, attacking us. And I love, the, you know, I love the fact that those two things, again, people love bird song because it makes us feel better. And it turns out it really does. It's not a sort of psychological, well, it is psychological, but it's genuine that listening to bird song calms us down and makes us feel good and at a time where we're, a lot of people are suffering from stress that's, that's a lovely thing i'm also fascinated when you hear stories of bird song being adapted as habitat changes and, and there are man-made sounds in a habitat and so bird song starts to imitate um man-made machines or noises of our society yeah, the European starling, which of course uh, a man took over to the States in 1890 and released 
30 of them in Central Park because he wanted every Shakespearean bird, every bird mentioned in Shakespeare in the States. And that was the only one that survived. All the others just died. And Starlings went. And Starlings imitate mobile phones. They imitate um, car alarms. You know, people go, what? Someone's, someone's left their car alarm. I got. And it's not. It's a Starling doing it, you know. Um, liar, the liar bird. There's a wonderful sequence with Sir David Attenborough, who, of course, is, is you know, equal only to the Queen in terms of love in Britain for, for, for someone. David Attenborough did an amazing sequence in a series called Life of Birds, um, which will have been on PBS. And life, um, he went and watched a lyrebird, which is a very bizarre Australian bird that actually does a visual and a vocal display. So it's one of the very few exceptions. And he had it imitating other birds like the kookaburra. And then it did a chainsaw and it did a camera, um, an old fashioned SLR camera before digital. It, it had its shutter, shutter going and then its motor drive. And it is perfect. I mean, you listen to it and you think they've added that recording. That can't be the bird, but it is. Look it up. It's on YouTube. So look it up. You'll find it. You know, it's, it's incredible. So, yeah, some birds do that. And they're females. What's fascinating is the females want them to do that and demand that they do it. Otherwise, they won't like with a peacock. They will not mate with a rubbish peacock. You know, it hasn't got very long things. Other birds, like the chiff chaff, are perfectly happy for the male, you know, the females are perfectly happy for the male just to go chiff chiff chaff. Chiff chaff. Red-eyed vireo is the same. It's a pretty boring song. <laughs> the bar is set low. Um, tell me some of your favorite bird names. Oh gosh. Well, I've got these sort of weird ones at the end, uh, like banana quit. Um, hard head, it's a good one, isn't it? It's a duck. Marvelous spatule tail. Oleaginous hemispingus is my absolute favorite. And swift. If you want a simple one, swift, because it is. Um, I've got vermiculated screech owl, which I saw on the Yucatan many years ago. Zigzag heron, zitting cysticola, firewood gatherer, crinkle collared manucode, Chuck Will's widow, one of yours, bearded mountaineer, and probably my favourite, banana quit, which is that little bird that if you go on holiday to the Caribbean, it'll come on your breakfast table and eat your food, little black and yellow thing. So. Um, we are almost out of time, but I sort of want to end where the book ends. Tell me about Mr. and Mrs. Morrow and their warbler. Oh, well, I discovered that I was 10 years old. 10 years old, I had a magazine called Birds of the World that my mum would buy me every week. My mum was a single parent. We didn't have very much money, but she always bought me this magazine. It's very special. And I was reading the Warblers issue and it had a list. It didn't even have an entry on this bird because it couldn't do all of them. But it had Mrs. Moreau's Warbler. And I just remember thinking, what a peculiar name. And then years, years later, 25, 30 years later, longer, actually, when I'm thinking of writing a book on bird names. And I thought, I'll call it Mrs. Moreau's Warbler. And then... I came up with a really stupid idea of going to the mountain in Tanzania where this bird lives, and it only lives on a couple of mountains in one range in Tanzania, to see it. And I, I told a couple of friends of mine, and they said, well, we'll come with you. And amazingly, and then we all met up and all our wives said, you're going on a jolly, aren't you? Said, no, no, we're going on a very, very important. It's <laughs> very important. For Stephen to write this book. Uh, anyway, we did go, we did eventually see it, and we then discovered about Reg. Reg Moreau was a very well-known in his time, in the early to mid 20th century, British ornithologist, a proper ornithologist, who went to Tanzania, lived there, and did all sorts of studies, both on migratory birds from Europe and Asia, but also on the local birds. And he found this bird, and he named it after his wife, which I think is incredibly romantic. And the the the... I, I indulged myself. I always have a, a dedication to all my books. And this is to Suzanne, after whom one day I hope to name a new species of warbler. And when I showed it to her, this is obviously my wife, she said, oh, you're going to go on another jolly. <laughs> I've, now, I've now got to go to a very obscure South American rainforest and find a new species of warbler or, or you know, somewhere in Asia or whatever. Um, 
Right. Who knows? So yeah, he was a really interesting man. And I had the joy, I had a very good friend called James who was in his, he died a few years ago in his late eighties. And James had known Reg Moreau. And he said to me, oh, he was a wonderful man. He said, you know, and I love that. I love that. I, I know someone who knew him because obviously I never met him or Winnie, Winnie can live on till the late 20th century, but you know, we never met. So I'd like to have met her. She, sound, she sounds like a, quite a character. If you read the book, you'll find out some stuff about her, which is fascinating. Indeed. And I put a link to the book in the chat um, through our bookshop.org storefront. And Stephen Moss, thank you so much for spending the last hour with us. It's been a delight. Oh, it's a real pleasure, Rebecca. And please, if anyone follows, goes on Twitter, I know Twitter's a bit controversial at the moment, wonder why. Um, but if you do, um, I'm happy to send you my, or you've probably got my um, tag. Please follow me or contact me if you've got any other questions about birds, you know, always happy to share them. Because people ask questions, when I give a talk, people always say, it's a very silly question, but it never is. It's never a silly question, because any question makes you think harder about why something happens in the world of birds so, and good luck with your wonderful museum if i will come to washington at some point and visit it let us know when you're here and good luck finding suzanne's warbler i will do my best <laughs> thank you so much